This is the You Winning Life Podcast, your number one source for mastering a positive existence. Each episode, we'll be interviewing exceptional people, giving you empowering insights, and guiding you to extraordinary outcomes. Learn from specialists in the worlds of integrative and natural wellness, spirituality, psychology, and entrepreneurship. So you, too and be winning life. Now, here's your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, certified neuro-emotional technique practitioner, and certified entrepreneur coach, Jason Wasser. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm really excited because today I have fellow podcaster Bryce Henson, who is the host of the Fitness Franchise Podcast as well as the CEO of the Fit Body Bootcamp, one of the world's fastest growing fitness bootcamp franchises. He has over 10 years of experience in the fitness industry and owning two of the Fit Body Bootcamp locations. And his passion is spreading fitness to the world, in addition to mentoring fitness professionals on how to grow their business and change more lives in their local communities. He's a mastermind group coach. He coaches other fitness and business professionals. And we're going to talk today about health and coaching and business development and public speaking and being an inspirational leader and living in your passion and making your passion partially your profit. So Bryce, thanks for joining. Really glad to have you. All right. So Bryce, welcome. Thanks, Jason. Super pumped to be here. I appreciate you having me on. So I'm super stoked because there's so many topics that we were pre-gaming and just going through your background, all of the different experiences that you've had, one in your personal life, two in this professional fitness life that I think that so many of the listeners can benefit from no matter what their background. So we can start wherever you want to start. I know that um, this wasn't originally what you were doing. You were not originally, you didn't grow up, you weren't born the CEO of Fit Body Food Camp. Yeah. And um, you know, one of the things that I love sharing with people and having my guests share with people is people end up doing things when they challenge themselves to things they never thought they'd be able to do, or putting themselves in roles, positions, careers, businesses that would never even be a consideration unless someone else challenged them to do that. So when you first started off in this fitness world, where were you? What was going on in life? What led you into deciding a franchise is something that you want to look into and then how that developed into you becoming the CEO of of this company? Yeah, great question. And I'll first tell my origin story in terms of how I got in the fitness space, uh, because I'm a transformation, I guess, uh, beneficiary. And then from there, we can kind of dive into actually how I kind of ascended the ranks, if you will, became the CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp. But, um, you know, first and foremost, I would like to tell people I'm from the Midwest, which would be partly true. I spent the first 10 years in Atlanta, and I have some stories there. But really, long story short, um, when I graduated from college, I was 21. Um, I ended up getting a full-time gig, a sales position out in Los Angeles, California, um, after, you know, pursuing, uh, an internship the summer before. And there I was moved to LA, the sunshine, the palm trees, the beaches, um, you know, uh, all the exciting things that California has to offer, uh, but also being the plastic capital of the world. So there I was 21 years young, uh, moved 3000 miles from home from the Midwest. And, um, you know, while I had a lot of good things going in California because of the job opportunity that in the, the new area, um, if I'm being honest with you, Jason, I had a lot more dark days than good. I you know, didn't have professional skills to offer the world. I moved 3000 miles from home. If you, your audience, you know, knows of, you know, or been through a move, you know, you can get homesick and low only and all that, which I certainly went through. Uh, but more, more importantly, I just didn't have confidence, enthusiasm, that you know, kind of energetic approach to life that I now do. And the reason was I wasn't fit. I, fitness was not a focus of mine. After four years of you know keg parties and Taco Bell as a staple of my diet, not necessarily conducive to a healthy fit lifestyle. Um, so you know, as I mentioned, I had a lot more dark days than good. And um, a fortuitous situation happened about a year after living in LA, which I was kind of second guessing myself. This, that, and the 
the other, maybe want to move back or try something new. And a good friend, actually a best friend at the time, his name's Adam, who we went to college with, uh, moved to Southern California. And Adam, um, he was, he's not on the cover of Men's Health, but he could have been. He had the six pack abs, you know, the ripped physique, uh, but the energy, the enthusiasm, the confidence. And I really looked up to that. And as it turns out, we ended up living together for a period of about two years. And after a few months of living together, um, I finally mustered up enough courage to be, you know, to say, hey, Adam, you know, you're, you obviously like a ref, really fit guy. I see you go in the gym. Could you teach me a thing or two about mm-hmm. fitness? And that's really when the light bulb went off. And so his, his response to me, Jason, was really, really, really strong. And I'm so grateful he did this because he said, Bryce, you've seen, you know, dozens of guys ask me how to lift weights or how to eat clean, uh, but how many have stuck with it? Very, very few. So I will teach you what I know, but I need you to commit for a solid 90 days that you'll do everything that I tell you. Come to the gym with me. You eat what I you know tell you to eat. And after after 90 days, if you want to quit, you can, but if I'm going to, if you're going to ask me, I need your you know, 90 day commitment. And I said, yes. And off to the gym, we went and Jason, man, I got to be honest with you. It was absolutely brutal. The first month. I mean, I second guessed myself. My muscles were sore, you know, and anyone who's listening to this podcast knows like, especially coming in cold Turkey, how challenging working out can be. Yeah. So from that point, um, I kind of, uh, stuck through it and, uh, you know, 30 days turned to 60, 60 to 90. And then I started seeing changes and, uh, over a period of six months, I just drastically transformed, transformed my body. I stripped around 20 pounds of body fat, put on 20 pounds of muscle, uh, but more so than anything. And again, if your listeners here have been through a physical transformation like that, yeah, you got the physique or I got the physique I was looking for. And that's a certainly beneficiary, but it's the confidence, the energy, the enthusiasm towards life in general. And I became one of the worst uh, performing sales rep in my company to all of a sudden the highest within a six month period, um, just changed my life. And really that's what sparked the passion for me to enter the fitness industry. I love that. So the, the transformation that people don't even consider of how they show up. And I actually am running a course, a four week workshop now called how I show up. And we start off with core values as the first thing that, you know, I have this belief in listeners have already heard this, but I can't, I can help you only once I know what your core values are. Cause how do we know what the barometer is to judge what you want your outcomes to be and whether they're truly in alignment for you or for your culture or for your, right. Whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Love that. Right. So once we have that decided, right. So for you, you decided like, okay, I need to have a life of confidence because I'm not feeling so great about myself. And because of that, I know there'll be outcome you committed to a process so I, and, and I know this, like that people talk about the new year's resolution for now in February, when we're recording this episode, right? The new year's resolution, especially working out last two to three gym visits, four gym yep. visits, right? Yep. I'm sure there's a ton of people who bought Peloton in the last year. And now that, you know, who are like, oh, can I sell this thing? Yep. The compounding interest of personal development is consistency. Oh, amen. So what have you, what did you find during those first 90 days where we all have those thoughts. I can't do this. My muscles are killing me. I can't believe I can't eat what I want to eat. I'm not capable of this. I know I'm not going to look the way I'm going to look. I'm not seeing the results that I want. It's not that instant gratification. What were some of the tools and the tips that you leveraged during that time to keep pushing you forward to that first, like that first 90 days? Yeah, great question. And to your point, it's consistency. That is the the really sweet spot. For me, um, there's there's a book called uh, Influence by a gentleman, a PhD named Dr. Cialdini. And he talks about six weapons of influence. So um, social proof and authority, and there's a few others, but one of them is commitment and consistency. So when you commit to something, human nature tends to follow through that commitment, at least short term. So the fact that Adam was able to get my commitment that has set the expectation that, okay, no matter what 90 days really helped because if he didn't do that, or if it was, uh, you know, uh, left open-ended, I think I would have had a more challenging time. So that was number one. Uh, number two was I committed to four days a week. Okay. So it wasn't like I completely overhauled. I was going cold Turkey all of a sudden seven days a week, perfect eating. It wasn't that at all. It was okay. Can I commit to four times, you know, to go to him with, with the gym, you know, during that period of time. And then I cleaned up my nutrition about four days of the week, you know, being honest with you, the first, you know, 90 days, probably even the six months, 
months, the weekends were still a crap show. Um, however, it gave me some consistency to build off of. So that would be, you know, point number two. And then I think for me and, and Jason, I know you're in this space, but I'm a huge proponent and believer in coaching uh, because that's what creates accountability. We all have blind spots. We all need, you know, extra support, especially if it's not your zone of genius. So what Adam introduced me to, when I look at this in hindsight was he introduced me to lifting weights and the circuit training and the nutrition and the clean eating, all those things that we actually do at Fit Body Bootcamp. So when I saw the model years later, I knew this is exactly what worked for me and worked for others. But the biggest thing that he introduced me to was that coaching and accountability. Because with if I was up to my own devices being at that point in my life, which was actually 15 years ago in early 2007, which is crazy to believe, I didn't have the knowledge, the belief in myself. And I actually borrowed off his belief. So that, that coaching and that, um, I guess, accountability was absolutely game-changing. And, and I'll finish um, the answer on this, uh, this tone. Tony Robbins is famously quoted saying, um, progress equals motivation. So, you know, I didn't rapidly change or transform, transform my physique in 90 days, but with consistency, with coaching, with commitment, um, and then also just seeing the results. By, by day 90, I had a little taste. And I saw, okay, this is actually working. Was I where I wanted to be? No, but, it, but that progress gave me more motivation to nail down those next 90 days, which then fast forward six months is really where the magic happened. So let's break down that, that quote because you know, everybody knows Tony Robbins yeah. and right, the, the break that down because a lot of people think it's the other way around. This is what I tell myself, Jason, every single morning, it's, it's opposite. It, it's counterintuitive because, you know, people think even for myself, I'm a fitness expert and a fitness professional, you must wake up just like super motivated, hit those weights every day. Honestly, I had a conversation with myself at 4 a.m. this morning when my alarm clock went. I did not feel like working out. In fact, most days I still do not feel like working out. However, what happens is I think Sir Isaac Newton, uh, the founder of physics, uh, one of his laws of motion um, really hit, the, hit, hit this in the head. A body in motion stays in motion. And yeah. the opposite is true. A body at rest stays at rest. So what happens is people think, oh, I'm not motivated. That's how it's going to be you know, for the next hour when I'm working out. And that's false. Actually, what, what happens is when you take that first step, the first probably five minutes of your workout, five to seven is the worst by far. But then once you get in motion, according to, to Isaac Newton, and of course, you know, back to Tony Robbins, progress equals motivation, you become more motivated. And the last, you know, 75% of your workout actually goes relatively smoothly. So it's about starting. That's actually what creates more traction momentum. And that momentum equals progress. So what were some of the biggest things once you started building momentum? And I completely agree with that. And that's like, I know from my own personality predisposition that I get stuck in my stuck places. And the answer that I realized over the last 30 days or 60 days has been do it anyway, right? A dish is sitting in my whatever. Okay. I, don't, I can do it tomorrow. No, no, no. Do it now. Do it or now. right. It, it is the do it now. And it's funny, like Nike does capitalize on that, right? That's the brilliance of their marketing. Oh, yeah. And, right. And you probably know this, but Nike's real motto isn't just do it. That's their uh, you know, their phrase or catchphrase. Mm -hmm. But their but their real um tagline is if you have a body, you're an athlete. And a lot of people I don't know, know that. that. Yeah. yeah know. Right. Because we think it's just do it. Right. But just that's it, their, yeah. that's their catalyzing statement. But their their mission, right, is if you have right, you are if you have a body, you are an athlete. Which is such that. a right, talking about that quote of flipping the, the the Tony Robbins, right? And the way we think it is the way it is, that's an that's a paradigm shift for most people. And then when I heard it, because we're gonna get into the entrepreneur stuff in a little bit, when I heard my coach Rick Sapio talk about that, right. If you create your core values and you hold yourself accountable to your core values, you're, entre you're an entrepreneur and you're being entrepreneurial. So in other words, when you decide, when you decided that the business model of Fit Body Bootcamp aligns with what you knew to be true, and this was a way to hold yourself accountable to that personal development side of your life, you are, you are automatically being entrepreneurial. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Because it aligned with what you saw to be proven true. And if I keep banging the drum on that over and over again, I will get the outcome, consistency, momentum, but alignment of values as I want to see it expressed in your situation in a business and a community. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And it's interesting, uh, Jason, we, speaking of core values, and I just love exactly what you're talking about. We just, we do quarterly trainings for our franchisee. We actually tour the country. We had one at the kickoff of the year um, here in Chino Hills, which is a suburb of LA, which is where our franchise headquarters are. We have next one um, in May in Phoenix, and then we're going to Nashville and then Florida you know, on, a, on a yearly tour. For all the technical training that we provide, the coaches training, nutrition training to be able to pr- provide our franchisees better results for their clients, the number one thing we actually always teach on is the foundation, the core values, our mission, our vision, our values, because without that, like nothing else matters. So we're just completely alignment. I just think there's a huge takeaway for your audience around this topic. Yeah. And I think this is like how many therapy clients, coaching clients, workout clients, right? If you're asking someone why you're, oh, I want to lose weight. Oh, I have a wedding. Oh, it's the holidays or right. I need to get it off. That's not necessarily a motivating, sustainable, long-term deep enough thing to get them to where they want to go. It's not enough, actually. It's not enough. You actually have to go way deeper than that to pull out a driving force, whether it's confidence, enthusiasm, energetic life, your spouse, you know, wants to, you you want your spouse to look at you the same way again. Those are the deeper issues, the fulfillment issues, the relationship issues, the life, you know, issues versus just the topical issue of losing weight or, you know, dropping a few pounds or, you know, shortening your waist size. So could agree with you more. Yeah. And there's something in your life that drastically changed because of this. And you, you know, when we were talking before, you talked about getting rid of something that was affecting you in your life and changing your life around because of Absolutely. Do you want me to go there? Let's go. Let's do it. Cool. Well, um, for our audience, we were talking offline just about, you know, the variety of things that we typically speak on. Jason had some awesome questions for me, but um, one of the things I teach on is leadership. And uh, there's four high income skills that we usually teach our franchisees. Um, copywriting, uh, we're be able to write awesome copy to move people. Uh, the presentation skills, we can order eight sales skills. And the third, the fourth one is leadership skills. Uh, and interestingly enough, when I got into this business as a, as a coach and a trainer and a business owner uh, for my first gym in 2012, which has been 10 years, you know, I, I was equipped with my own transformation story. I had, you know, learned a lot institutionally through, you know, fitness and nutrition. So I knew I had a lot of value to add, um, but I didn't really fully grasp the, the level of leadership that was needed, not only for myself, my clients, my team, and now our whole franchise organization. So famously, you know, buy into the quote that leadership is the, always the problem. It's always the solution. Um, so this all to say and kind of to storytell a little bit, Jason, on one thing that yeah. you just mentioned that I removed from my life. It's actually uh, a story that is a blessing, but it was disguised as a tragedy. And I really hopefully that hits home with your audience. If you look back in your life and some of the biggest stumbling blocks and challenges, if reframed and learned from those can actually be, you know, the, the biggest accolades in your life. And this story is this, the same, you know, with me and, um, So it's 2016, and I had um, a few locations of my business, um, you know, Fit Body Bootcamp franchise locations off the ground. And it was a family thing. I incorporated my wife, my mom, my brother, and also my sister. She was leading uh, one of the locations that we had. And, um, you know, kind of to even back that story up a little bit, um, my father was uh, an alcoholic, and uh, it was a very, you know, we escaped a very traumatic situation when I was younger. Um, So for me, it was a very humbling situation to realize that in my late 20s, after waking up from a blackout, I realized for the first time that, holy smokes, I might have an issue with alcohol. And for me, it was interesting. And, you know, Jason, maybe you can, um, you know, some of your audience can relate. I always thought of an alcoholic as someone who didn't have a job, was homeless, was a bum, drank out of a, a brown paper bag. For me, that was just never the case. In fact, I like to classify myself as more of a binge drinker. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would work really hard during the week. And of course, in college, you know, that was one thing. But even as like my 20s kind of came through, I actually dress uh, drank less frequently, but with more intensity um, as I grew, you know, through my late twenties and early thirties. So I had this realization. Um, and unfortunately my sister, same genetic, same DNA was affected by the same genetic disposition. And um, you know, what I realized is going through a lot of challenge and struggle and whatnot is that I failed as a leader um, to lead her um, in the proper path um, of, you know, abstaining from alcohol, you know, removing that for my life because granted it didn't cause the amount of like big chaos that it did in hers but it could have been way different and the luck of the draw happened a few times that uh, you know situation could have been different but in any case all this to say um to to kind of conclude and, and really you know, story tell 
we had a, a challenge party at the end of 2016. We had the six week transformation challenge, a lot of results, and we finished it with, with an awesome event uh, just to celebrate our clients. Well, as it turns out, there was drinking involved for, with my sister and the team. And again, uh, in hindsight, I look back, I take ownership of that because I, I could have led by a better example, even though I didn't drink in that particular situation, just life in general. So after the event was done, I had to interject and it was just a very embarrassing situation. I had to jump in. My young team, um, you know, was, was drinking alcohol and it just wasn't, wasn't a good look by any stretch of the imagination. So that next day I had a conversation, not only with my team, but I had a conversation with my sister and I said, Emma, you know, I love you dearly. You are an incredible soul. You've built this awesome gym on your back. You're just charismatic. Everyone loves you. But similar to me, we share in the same issue, um, which is, you know, the problem with alcohol, just like our father, just like our father's father. And I said to her, I said, you know, I, I don't see a silver lining and a positive outcome if this continues. So forever is a long time, but we need to create an agreement that for the next 12 months, we're going to abstain from this. Otherwise, it's going to lead to more chaos um, that it had ensued the years before. So this all to say, Jason, after I had that conversation with her, and it was probably the fifth or sixth serious conversation around the same topic, I went home. And I went home and I was defeated. I just, you know, after, you know, really challenging situation, um, I got, got to sleep and I woke up and I look, I looked at the mirror and I had a deep, dark, heavy look at the mirror. And I thought to myself, you know, how am I going to expect my sister to do something that I can't even do myself? And I realized that in our society and rightfully so we'll actually confer, we have forgiveness in our hearts for criminals, but not hypocrites. And uh, I, that, at that moment in time, I knew that if I was going to be the best, I guess, person and leader for her, that I actually had to lead first in moral authority. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to report that was the last time I drank alcohol. That was over five years ago. And while I'm not fixed, it's a work in progress. I feel like I'm addicted to a lot of very healthy things, working out and work and all that. Um, you know, the, the journey continues. But without that shift in my life and without my leading a better example for her, um, the situation, you know, I, I wouldn't be here today. So I think that's the, the message I want to share with you and your audience. The profoundness of that is right. We all have these similar things that we don't realize in some way that's holding us back from accomplishing what we can truly accomplish from connecting how we want to connect from being the type of person. We get so stuck in those stories, especially intergenerational themes. Yeah, And I know, right. I, my, you know, my, the stuff that I'm unpackaging now at 43 that I started realizing maybe in my early twenties, but then I thought I was doing the work on in my twenties. And it turned out I wasn't, I was looking at it from the wrong perspective, or I was staying too stuck in a victim mentality about it and still blaming and still right. The leader, I think the leadership thing is that full accountability, right? The more accountability you can take, the more of a leader you become. And that reciprocal process allows you to have more influence Amen. People around you. Amen. I mean, really leadership, I define it um, as, as uh, someone who is going to take a res- responsibility for a problem that's theirs and not theirs as well. And that's really the definition, at least one of many of leadership. And uh, you just need to be able to, you know, hold yourself accountable in order to, to hold your, your team, your clients, your community accountable in whatever endeavor. So for me, I just saw a shiny weakness. Um, in that. And uh, while it was a complete tragedy, um, ended up having to part ways with my sister in a very tr- tragic event after that situation. It was, it was the worst thing that I probably have ever went through. However, there was a silver lining there and it showed a weakness for me and it showed something I need to remove in my life to get to the next level. And to your point, Jason, you hit it. I mean, your audience, you know, you, we're, we're human, we're fallible. We have all yeah. issues and whether it's alcohol, whether it's gambling, whether it's, you know, other addictions of pornography, there's something in your life that is not serving you and it's time to wake up and say, okay, um, it's time to make a move if I want to get to the next level. And this goes to a whole nother level of when I talk about the core values, people don't ever talk about their anti-values. And I love this add on that if we really, right. Life can change when you start living into these things. Like I want to have fitness in my life. I want to have spirituality in my life. I want to have high quality people in my life, but what are the what are the anti-values? In other words, someone can show up or some situation can show up with this, but the way that I look at anti-values is it's a non-negotiable list that even if the core values are there, if one, two, or three, or any one of these things show up that's on this anti-value list, it's still a no of engagement because the toleration of those things will eventually lead you to breaking your values because we do have a 
dispensation of like, I don't want to be an asshole. I don't want to be a dick. I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to be right. And I always like playing the difference between judgmentalness and discerning. And that's, and we can get into a whole conversation about the difference between those two things. But we always have like, I realized this in one of my coaching groups for young professionals was people would rather continue dating someone else because they'd rather not make them think that they're the person who ended it because they don't want to be considered the person who's the asshole than being an asshole to themselves by staying in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And granted, I mean, Jason, you obviously have a ton more experience specific to that, but I've seen it and, you know, for my friends and circle as well. So very interesting. Yeah. So let's jump into, you're going on this fitness journey. You're going on this personal development journey. So the space that we missed was getting introduced to fit body bootcamp, yeah. deciding, right. You know, you were already working out why, and when did you know that you wanted to be a professional in this industry? And what was that process of like, okay, so I know I want to do this. What way do I want to go to it? Do I want to create, do I, you know, personal training? Do I want to own a gym? Do I want to right? why, you know, and then what leads you to a franchise versus creating something from scratch? Yeah, great question. Before I dive into the intricacies, I give a keynote at times, which I call the three P's, which is pain, passion, and purpose. And I find that, you know, entrepreneurs, the most successful entrepreneurs typically have gone through something very painful or traumatic. They figured out the solution for it and then it's become a passion of theirs. And then from there, it, you know, with time and retention and consistency, which is a common theme of today's talk, it then becomes, you know, your purpose. And I feel, you know, similar to me, that's how my journey, I guess, continued. So I was in pain. I wasn't a confident guy. I didn't have the energy, the enthusiasm, the vibrancy that I now have. It's because I didn't, you know, lack the confidence in my fitness and myself. So, you know, going through that pain point, solving that pain point, then created a passion for fitness. Uh, and then ultimately has led it to my purpose here. And, you know, how that all kind of unpacked was after I went through that transformation, that six month journey in 2007, I continued to adopt then the healthy and fit lifestyle. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, I think in 2009, when I was working out at the gym and I'll never forget this, Jason, someone, some dude walk up to me and he asked me how I did this set and what I ate, you know, in terms of my supplementation and my nutrition and like a light bulb, it was crazy because my identity was becoming a fit guy, but I never thought in a million years that like, holy smokes, this dude's asking me like yeah. Bryce, holy smokes. So that's when that light bulb went on. And, um, you know, then I thought to myself at the time, I, I still had some limiting beliefs. I didn't actually think I could make fitness a full career uh, because I was uh, being the benefactory, beneficiary of fitness. My sales career was doing well. So I thought, okay, maybe I'd become a personal trainer and help, you know, some people on the nights and weekends. So actually that, that's what I did. And I enrolled myself and passed the National Academy of Sports Medicine, which is the gold standard of personal training certification. Um, I ended up picking up some clients and friends on the nights and weekends, which I would train just as more of a passion project. Um, and I think I updated my Facebook profile to certified personal trainer. And when I did this guy named Bedros Koulian, who's the founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, a dear friend, um, you know, one of my best friends and a mentor to this day, um, started serving me ads about how to grow a personal training practice and how to, you know, get new clients and how to convert them to long-term members. So, I ended up following this guy named Bezos for a period of actually two years. Uh, at that point, I then made a, ch- a life transition. I ended up moving to South America for two years. I always wanted to learn another language and live a different culture, country and culture. So I scratched that box. But as I was living there and when I knew I was coming back to, to the U.S. and California in early 2012 is when I started paying a little bit more attention to this brand called Fit Body Bootcamp that he was talking about in his email and whatnot. So from there, I did as much diligence as I possibly could. I was in my late 20s. 28 at the time, uh, moving back to California, all the research I could find about Fit Body Bootcamp and Bedros I did. And uh, basically in the summer of 2012, when I got back, I you know came to our headquarters here and met Bedros himself and took the leap of faith and ended up putting down the money for my first territory, first gym. And a few months later is when, when I opened my first Fit Body location, which really then we can story tell, but that's kind of how my foundation and entry point to Fit Body Bootcamp happened. So my of all the awesome things that were in that sequence, the <laughs> first thing that's thinking out, like there's people that I've met throughout my therapy, pers- therapy development or skills journey. And then in the entrepreneur world, people I've met as well along that journey. And everybody has their own marketing things. And there's really 
there's people who somehow I get on their email list or somehow they subscribe you without you wanting them to, and you get, you get <laughs> off of those, right? Yep. But there's one or two people in the personal development entrepreneur world that I religiously will check their stuff and that I would only consider spending a high value amount of money, like over a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 300, whatever it is. In other words, a bigger investment than just like whatever to go participate or be part of their community. And their communication is so clear because they're creating, here's what's not, not just like, are you the type of person who's struggling with like, but it's so tangible with what you're going to get out of it. And it so speaks to that 80, 20, right? That 80% of the people, they can go F off and we're not speaking to you. If it's the 20% that aligns you, we want a hundred percent of our people to be the 20, right? To be the 20%. Yep. yep. What was it about the marketing? What was it about the copy? What was it about the message that was hitting you that made you decide that this is the person you want to talk to and this is the business that you want to be aligned with? Simply put, the first thing that comes to mind is the authenticity. Um, so Bedros is an incredible marketer. He's a rags to riches story. He's really like the true American dream story, which I am as well, but he's in the traditional sense that he comes from a uh, former communist, uh, communist, uh, Russia, I guess, Armenia, which is one of that's in the mm-hmm. Soviet bloc in 1980, his family bribed the communist party to basically get to the U S literally came with nothing, just the clothes on their backs. In the first year, the first few years, they moved to like, you know, section eight housing to section eight housing. They didn't have money for food. They literally, he was six years old at the time. And his mom used to throw him in the dumpsters behind the local supermarket because there's food that is ex- te- technically expired, but right. still can be relatively eaten. And especially for a family, you know, uh, you know, escaping communism. So that all said, I think just the ability for him to craft a story and be authentic and share his vision and share like his background really, really connected with me. And then of course, you know, he went through his own fitness transformation and there was just a lot of, you know, great aspects of the Fit Body Bootcamp brand, the low startup costs, the, you know, the high, the, the ability to leverage yourself, the, the higher profit margins. So there's a lot of other things that went into it, but to your point, Jason, when you asked, what was the thing that was compelling me that attracted me in, it was the authenticity of the message. Yeah. So then people are in, like, so people are in a job, they're in a career, they're looking for something else. And right. Franchises were kind of like, you know, in my mind going through this journey, it's like franchises are the MLMs of, a, of an actual legit business. Right. And that's the negative stigma that it probably had can't 80s well, and be. 90s. And it can be right. And there are people out there who are doing that. What are some of the questions someone should ask? to start sorting through because you have invested and you have multiple businesses within the business itself. And then you've also worked your way up into becoming the CEO, but what were some of the questions you needed to ask, or you were guided to ask that helped you discern that this is a good investment. This is a good model. This is a good long-term game plan for you that maybe someone doesn't think about or doesn't even know what to ask or to look for. Yeah. Um, incredible question. I mean, I think first and foremost, just the financial metrics and, and I'm not a huge data driven guy, but believe it or enough, I feel like I stack myself with like really strong analysts that to compensate for this. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure from a financial perspective, the business model works that you have enough, you know, capital and working capital to get it off the ground. Uh, so it was a very easy um, business model to understand, which was really, really beneficial to me, especially that was my first entrepreneur endeavor. Um, Second, it just fell in line with my passion and, you know, nothing against Subway or any of the awesome franchises that, you know, do serve food, but, you know, fitness is a passion-based business. So I was really excited. Um, I was passionate. I went through my own transformation. So I knew that passion would lead me to success. And the third thing would be, um, was just, you know, talking. And at the time there was only about 15 or 20 franchisees in the system at that point. This is literally 2012 was the first year franchise. Pedro started it in 2008, 2009, just after the housing market crash there's a licensee mm-hmm. program but in any case i talked to the 15 or 20 people i mean i relentlessly had hand, uh, hounded them down just to you know talk about their experience and we call that the validation process you can talk to other owners in the system so i would highly encourage you to you know if, if you're an, uh you know listening to this and you're exploring you know uh opening a fit body boot camp or some other franchise just to do your diligence you know make sure the numbers work uh you know have a, a real talk with yourself looking at your own you know uh numbers to make sure that you can fund them 
business, um, making sure that it's a business model and uh, the industry is in line with your passion or something that you really want to do. And then talking to other owners. I mean, that did a lot for me because what it did is actually it verified because, you know, I, I saw the success. I saw the client transformations. I saw, you know, I talked to owners that had success with the model, but really I, always, I believe that leadership starts with top down in any organization. So it's also just getting some, you know, social proof and verification that, Bedros, who was was who he said he was, and by far, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, everyone was raving fans. So those three things really checked the box for me, and it gave me the confidence to move forward. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. I think the due diligence that we either go over too much, and therefore we become paralyzed by making a decision, or we just hope that it's going to work out, and we don't do enough due diligence. We don't talk to enough people, and I see this all the time. I actually, people who are wanting to become therapists now, like. I used to be like, oh yeah, it's a great, you know, go with great field, great program. Here's a program to go to. Here's a program is not go to, don't go to. And now in 2022, I'm kind of like, I really am going to push hard into the person and be like, why do you really want to do this? Get a job at Starbucks. If you want to talk to people all day and make the same amount of money, probably with benefits at the right in that process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and then grow into management and grow into, right. You can do therapy in different ways without having to worry about the liabilities and the case notes and the, if you take insurance and all that crap and right. And, and God forbid, right. High risk cases versus no low risk cases, which I'm, I, you know, I'm not a mental health practice. I'm a personal development therapy practice and I'll do couples and I'll do relationships, but I won't see certain types of, of, of situations. Um, right. The, the simplicity over the complexity model. Yeah. But a lot of Which, people don't know that because you get the shit at the beginning, you have to take on all those things. And what's that like? And do you know what you want? And do you have a business mentality? All these things that people don't ask where now I'm more likely to turn somebody away from, in my opinion, from this field, because you need to have all these other sides, right? So the branding, the marketing you said was part of this package that's worked into simple done for you opportunities. It is, but Jason, to your point, I think that's so sage advice because, you know, while someone may have an interest at the end of the day, do they have the mental capacity, especially when you get to your point of all the, the risk of being an entrepreneur? I mean, that, that's real, right? And at the end of the day, like shit is going to hit the fan. Not everything's going to go perfect. Um, that is just the, the way of the warrior, the way of an entrepreneur. So not only do you have to have all the ad- analytical aspects, the branding, the marketing, the finances sorted out, but you actually have to just really be honest with yourself. Do you have the mental capacity? capacity to get to keep on going when the going gets tough because I probably have like three or four big make or break stories like and one of my gyms literally the the city wanted to shut me down because of permitting Mm -hmm. and there's no there's no handbook for that there's no like from a franchise perspective like I had to dig deep like get resourceful end up you know going to the city making my plea talking about like how we inspire fitness and change lives but all all this to say Jason is you do have to have the mental capacity and fortitude you got to be honest with yourself to make sure that you're whatever endeavor that you're going to actually pursue that you can execute. Yeah. And I, and I think that goes back into the idea of like having a business versus being an entrepreneur. And, and I really worked my way through this the last couple of years about owning a business makes you entrepreneurial, but it doesn't make you an actual entrepreneur. In other words, Amen. there's the thought process of that and, and, and not everybody, right. Just because you start a business doesn't make you the CEO either, right? A CEO is not a solo. You're not a CEO. If you're a solo practitioner, like I'm not a CEO, I'm a solo practitioner. I have two associates. They're virtual, right? They get their clients and I, you know, right, right? it's a piece of the pie. It's some level. every, every, listen, at the end of the day, everything's in, uh, is multi-level, right? But, um, but I'm taking the risk. I'm creating structure and creating things. But I want people to realize this when they talk about like, especially the social media, you know, the last couple of years of like, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be an entrepreneur, but you're doing this hustle that everything does go back to systems. Everything goes back to structure. Everything goes yep. back to methodology. Everything goes back to, yes, you can create money. You can create, I can create money when I'm working, but am I creating money when I'm not working? And I think that's more of that like e-myth mindset of right entrepreneur yeah. manager technician. And I'm having this conversation with a lot of my clients, like, oh, I want to start a side hustle. I'm like, no, you want to start a side technician job mm-hmm. because you're already a technician during this day and you want to be a technician when you're not working on your days off. What about make building that up to making something where you hire people who are also off and you hire them and you structure an organ. Oh, I didn't think about it that way. It's a different ball game. I mean, a huge fan of Michael Berger's work for that reason. Right. So, yeah. So how do you see that? Like one of the reasons, you know, of you going from a personal trainer to a gym owner 
to now a CEO, how did that mindset shift? And what did you have like any aha moments or like realizing like, oh, I no longer see it this way. I have this new awareness. Do you have any experiences or examples of when that kind of those little micro nuggets kind of shifted for you? And like, it's like, oh, I've been doing it the hard way my whole life or, oh, this is the way that we're taught to go to work for 40, 50 years, then retire. Right. But we stay in that one little thing. Yep. So for me, it's interesting enough. There's two big aha moments that really helped me with my ability to actually rise the rank, become CEO of this awesome organization. Um, And it comes down to leadership, um, which we talked a little bit about. And then also to adopting, we talked about systems. Um, I stumbled upon this book called Traction, uh, which is written by a gentleman, Gina Wickman, who's the creator of EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. And that, that foundation of EOS is just dramatically shifted our business in the last three plus years um, to incorporate proper accountability, to incorporate proper communication, proper leadership, and more importantly, the systems and structure to run a multiple eight figure business a year. Like when you factor in all of our franchisees, um, you know, globally in North America. So I think those, those two paradigm shifts of leadership, which we talked a little bit about a couple of stories that I had um, that really led me to believe that I need to be a, a, a stronger leader that leads by moral authority, meaning I, I talk my walk um, or I walk my talk, if I can say that correctly, um, in addition to the fact of like having strong business systems at play. But for me, and, and you know, maybe this is the, the answer that you're looking for, but Jason, I really do feel that I was, I was inherently, I knew that, okay, while well, fitness is what I want to do, I was passionate about it. I also knew that one of the things I had to do very quickly is to get myself off the training floor because I was working in the business. And really, I, I from the very beginning, I knew that I want to build an empire. So I kind of had that a little bit factory installed in me already. I just needed to learn, needed to, learn to learn the leadership, the communication, and then the business systems to be able to help me elevate and work on the business in the words of Michael Gerber of Emith, instead of specifically working in the business. And I think with that factory installed mindset and some of the, the, the learning lessons of leadership of business systems of EOS really helped me um, ascend the ranks and, and, and talk to you as our CEO. Yeah, and I think the mindset behind all of that of shifting from like, I have to do it all to being able to bring other people in. One of my, one of my buddies calls it the Superman, Superwoman syndrome in that regards. And, okay. and, I, and I playfully call it the Colonel's secret recipe. God, like, someone's going to find out the recipe yes. to do it and they're going to steal it and, re- right, and run away with it. And and I think that's those two paradigms, a Superman, Superwoman syndrome. And I can't release the Colonel's secret recipe. That's so powerful because I, I was that way for a long time. And I was so guarded if a new coach was going to basically like open a competing business. And now I'm like, holy smokes, good luck. I will support you a million ways to the moon, but it's the execution. It's not the secret recipe. And I think that that shift happened. And for me, it's interesting. Probably the biggest shift that I had in my younger younger entrepreneurial endeavors is I, there's a lot of people that want to work and help support you build your dream. And I think because I always had that CEO, like business ownership mindset, it blew me away. I actually, it, it still humbles me to this day, realizing that the vast majority of people and probably for good reason, shouldn't open their business. Like it, it, it's challenging. You know, you've seen this, the, the data behind it. Who's an entrepreneur, you have to conduct the whole symphony, if you will. There's a lot of people that really want to stay in their lane, be really strong technicians. And really, if you're a good person, you have strong passion, if you're doing good work, want to stay support you. And I think for me, that was probably a big learning lesson that I learned probably one or two years in. And that really let me realize that, okay, uh, it's okay that I want to coach every session. It's okay. Cause other, there's people that want to coach. There's people that want to do nutrition. There's people that want to do administrative work. My job as a leader and entrepreneur is just to arrange the symphony, the symphony, get out of the way and let the team execute. Right. And, I, and that's part of their purpose and their mission. Like some yeah. people really are experts at bookkeeping. Some people are experts at, right. And, and by not, by us keeping that on in our role and take, we're taking away someone else's purpose. Right. And yes, we're leveraging time for money, but if they're an expert and that's the top of their capacity and that's what they are put in this earth to do. And it's not like, Oh, one job is better than the other. And no, judge, right. No. It's really about we're yeah. taking away. We're not allowing other people to live in their purpose by us taking that on and hoarding all of the positions in our, and that's why what he talks about the org chart, right? Michael Gerber about the org chart in the business. Yeah. You might start off doing all of those things, but I'm not a copywriter. I don't know how to write really good copy. I don't know where I have a website that I go to for hashtags. Is that the best type place to go for hashtags? I don't know. It's working relatively. Okay. 
right? And, and I don't know what's going to get me into the algorithm or not get me into the algorithm. And when I started deleting fake followers, I lost my Instagram account a year and a half ago and I had to restart a new one from scratch, right? So we th- that has to be done by people who are experts in that. But I see so many business people, oh, I need to do my social media and oh, I need to do work on my website and oh, I need to sit at Starbucks for eight hours learning this thing. Okay, but is that making you the better at the best thing that you're best at? Make more money on that and then refer out Delegate the rest. And, and, and there's people that want to be awesome copywriters and want to be awesome administrative leaders and want to do awesome in our business, nutrition coaching. Yeah. So to that point, like, you know, take a step back and let your team run and, and know that the power of delegation is actually like what's the truly most impactful thing for entrepreneurs. So definitely on the yeah. same page there with you, Jason. And, and maybe just to wrap that up like, with why maybe some people will benefit from a franchise versus starting a business by their own is because the leverage is there right? It's the proven method, at least in the ones that people are doing the due diligence in and seeing like what you're seeing, right? The leverage is there. You don't have to start from a scratch. It's a plug and play. And that's going to take away all the areas you don't have to be an expert on because that's why the franchisee has invested all their time, effort, money into creating that structure to make it leverageable and more simple at the end of the day for everybody else that's investing in that business. Amen. I mean, we have 15 years of trial and error and proven systems and processes that, you know, someone who's going to join our franchise, as an example, is getting the handbook from day one, which took us 15 years to evolve and bigger picture as well. The value in in, in any franchise system is also the network within it, because we always like to say we can create faster than the other competition can copy, uh, can copy. And we're in any given situation, we're doing five to 10 tests where there's a marketing campaign, what's email copy was a program that the individual entrepreneur is just not going to have the ability to, to, to execute against. So from a leverage perspective, from a network perspective and the proven model uh, for me, and it's not for everyone, franchising isn't for everyone, uh, but for me, it was just a huge, huge win. And uh, there's you know a lot of people in that same boat. Awesome. So for everybody who's been listening and there was even just one little nugget of something that you loved and uh, want to grab more from Bryce, Bryce, where can they find you? I know there's a few different websites and a few different places in the podcast. So throw yeah. those out to everybody. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, both my social handle and my website are all, all in one. So uh, real Bryce Henson, uh, not to be confused with fake Bryce Henson. So uh, that's where you can find me on all my social channels, real Bryce Henson and the website's real Bryce So that's the best way to connect and would love to, to stay in touch and add value for you and, and your audience any way that I can. Awesome. And if anybody out there really did benefit from the show, please do me a favor, go on, you know, iTunes usually is the main one. Just leave us a positive, favorable rating and also go to Bryce's podcast. And that's called the Uh, fitness franchise podcast. So there you go. So anybody's interested in that world and what it's like to grow. And then there's other, I saw some of the topics on the show and you don't have to have a a franchise because there's so many different marketing skills and other stuff that you talk about. But if you're into that world of marketing and scaling and growing, there's some really good episodes on that as well. And Bryce, I really do thank you for hanging out and I'm excited for the success and growth and the journey that you're on. Jason, thank you so much, man. This was so pleasurable. You're an awesome host and uh, just really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure, brother. Thanks for listening to the You Winning Life podcast. If you are ready to minimize your personal and professional struggles and maximize your potential, we would love it if you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at You Winning Life.